Not sure where I'm meant to go here. Hi. Great. Hey. Hello. Thank you all for coming. Um, my name is Johan Hari. I'm, I wrote a book about the war on drugs called uh, Chasing the Scream, the first and last days of the war on drugs, which is why I'm here. I just want to um, acknowledge at the start, as you were saying, it's a bit difficult in this meeting. I know there's going to be some people in the audience who are going through withdrawal symptoms um, from David Cameron. Um, <laughs> we've, we've had six years of freebasing. We're Cameron, we're, we're waking up in our own vomit, wondering what we just did. It's a tragedy, but we're going to... Mark is here to help us get through our trauma. <laughs> he understands it. Um, there's a real cliche you, you always say when you, you do an event like this, which is, oh, it's a real pleasure to be with X. It really is a pleasure to be with, with, with Dr. Mark Lewis. I've learned a huge amount from him. There's a small band of um, addiction dissidents across the world who are arguing that we've profoundly misunderstood addiction. What causes it, what it is, how we recover from it. And I think Mark is one of the two or three most valuable voices in that movement in the world. He's doing really extraordinary work. Just to give a sense of why it matters to us here, last year, 3,346 3, people died of addiction-related causes in Britain. That is the highest figure in our history. Not long after that figure was announced, David Cameron said that our drugs policy was a success. Um, and I don't think the methadone of uh, Theresa May is going to make us much better. Uh, I don't mean literal methadone, which is a good thing. Um, so, so Mark Lewis is a, professor of develop, uh, is a professor of developmental neuroscience and applied psychology at Radboud University in the Netherlands. He's also a professor emeritus at the University of Toronto. He's the author of over 50 scientific uh, journal publications and the author of two really brilliant books, which I'm going to plug relentlessly throughout this conversation, <laughs> Memoirs of an Addictive Brain and The Biology of Desire. The Biology of Desire is the more recent one and will probably uh, uh, dominate our conversation tonight. But... Um, so for Mark, this is not just an uh, abstract question. His authority to talk about this comes from his science, but I want to start a little bit by talking about your personal experience with this, okay. if you feel comfortable with that. Yeah, that's fine. Um, so do, could we start with, there's a moment, a very powerful moment you describe, a moment when you overdosed and the people you were with thought, thought you had died. Sure, but can I sneak in a comment? Uh, we need to talk about the two or three people who have done the most to change our, our perspective on addiction. He's, he's one of the other ones. Oh, well, that's sadly I mean, not true, but thank I, I, no, you. No, it is, and, and his book is amazing. It's fantastic. It's a wonderful read. Oh, so, thank you. So we approach it from slightly different angles, but we actually converge a lot. Yeah. We did a radio show in Australia where they kept trying to get us to fight and uh, failed. <laughs> yes. Is that what they were trying to do? I think so. I, I mean, she sure. had a kind of mean, like, fight, fight face. I, I couldn't thought. understand what they were saying, actually. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point. <laughs> Their accents are so strong. They are very strange. Sorry, okay, your, your question was? So you, we, would, we thought maybe perhaps we could start with the moment, that moment, that very powerful moment you described, quite, quite early, I think, in your problematic drug use when you, when you experienced an overdose. Could you tell, tell the audience a bit about that? Yeah, it was about maybe the, the sixth or eighth time I, I'd done heroin, and I was a total novice. I was, what, about 18 or 19, maybe? Um, and I thought it was really cool to be a, a bad boy and do a very bad drug, and I really had no idea how much I was doing. Um, and, uh, well, you know, uh, my, my friend, a, a guy who I really liked and respected and admired said, you better not do too much, you better not do it tonight, and so on and so forth. I ignored him entirely, and then I woke up in a bathtub um, some time later, and I said, what am I doing in this warm bathtub? And he said, it's not a warm bathtub, it's a cold bathtub, but your body temperature is so low that you don't notice it. And uh, it was really strange to have come that close to death, and of course you don't realize it. And what, what I felt afterwards mostly was shame, uh, you know, how could I do this? This is a really awful thing to do. And then the next most surprising thing was that I didn't stop. That's, uh, right, that's kind of just made me more careful. Now, can you talk a bit about how your addiction progressed or, or continued from there? Yeah, well, I'd, I'd come out of a, a boarding school in Massachusetts, which was a horrible experience for me. I didn't like it at all. I came out depressed and anxious and lonely and messed up. And uh, then I got to Berkeley, California in 68, and that was like the mecca of the, you know, the hippie movement and the drug movement at exactly the right moment. So I, I just wanted to dive into those waters. It was tremendously welcoming. And I, I did everything that was going around. And then a push came to show. I spent a year in India, smoked a lot of opium, and it ended up back in Toronto. And then I started 
doing something really nasty, which is I started stealing pharmaceuticals from uh, doctor's offices and um, f pharmacies. And from the lab, I would steal morphine. I was working as a psych student, and I would steal morphine from the big peanut butter jars of morphine lying around the lab for the rats, who didn't seem to miss it. So um, I just kept taking it. And, uh, then, and I just got into this pattern. I was in a very bad marriage at the time. And uh, I got into the cycle of doing it and feeling horrible regret and feeling guilt and shame and all the usual things that addicts feel. And then being clean for a week or two and then going back through the cycle. And that went on for a few years. And uh, yeah, well, addicts always try to quit. I mean, they always try to quit because it's not fun, it's not nice, and it's, it's not rewarding really. And, Eventually, they often succeed. They usually succeed. The statistics show that, that they, uh, more often than not, addicts get better. They, they recover, and they often do so without formal treatment, and that was the case for me. I just worked on it for a while, and then I took a more serious stance and um, tried meditation and tried Tai Chi and got to a place where I could say, I really don't want to do this anymore, really, really, really don't want to do this anymore, and got, got the upper hand, and things were okay. And you described this very interesting moment when you were at that boarding school, so prior to your drug use, some, some alcohol use, but not much, mm -hmm. where you, you say you were, you were thinking, please, God, let me disassociate. Yeah. So it's fascinating. You were longing for the thing that drugs gave you before you found the drug. It's true, yeah. Could you talk a bit about that? Yeah, that was the case for me, and I think it's the case for most people who get into addiction. Mm. You, most people who feel good about themselves, who feel okay at home in the world with themselves, with their environment, just don't become addicts. They just don't. You need a certain kind of motivation and thrust to get you there. And uh, for me, it was that feeling of the world is not a friendly place. There was bullying and, and anti-Semitism and nasty stuff going on. I was far from home. I was a kid still. And I just, uh, I just wanted to, I, you know, it, it was like finding a switch. It was like finding, I can do this and make myself feel differently. And that was an amazing realization that I could take a substance and change my state, change my mood. It was a, sort of a beautiful realization. Well, that means I have control of it. And that, I suppose, lasted for years. I mean, throughout my addiction, uh, that was always, say, the fundamental belief, the underlying cognitive trap. Well, it's not really a trap. It's true. You can change the way you feel, but you don't recognize at first that uh, there are consequences that come just afterward. And it's fascinating that and this is something you've been so helpful in, in reframing. So often when this is debated, I know you get asked to go on radio and TV to do this incessant debate as well, people will frame it as, is addiction uh, a moral failing or is it a disease? With the clear implication, well, if it's a moral failing, you're a bad person. If it's a disease, it's okay, we can be sympathetic and nice. And one of the things that you've been so brilliant at is saying, well, that's the wrong dichotomy. Yeah. C can you talk a bit about that? Yeah, yeah, I think it's a false dichotomy. It's, um, it's actually a trichotomy. <laughs> Is there, is there such a word, do you think? We've invented it in person. <laughs> um, because the, the idea, and there's a lot of really uh, quite impassioned debate about this stuff. The, the status quo, the dominant position is that addiction is a, is a disease. It's, in fact, nowadays it's defined as a chronic brain disease. And this is an idea that's been evolving for decades and decades. Well, it sort of started with the fusion of 12-step, the 12-step movement and medicine in the 60s in the US. Uh, 50s and 60s, and then came the decade of the brain in the 90s, and we got really good neuroimaging uh, um, technology. And then p the medical community could say, look, that's where the disease is. It's right there in the brain. That part there looks different in addicts than it does in normal people. So it's a brain disease, and it's a chronic brain disease. And that idea sort of fastened itself in the whole addiction world, the community, from treatment providers to policymakers to addicts and their families. And uh, so, uh, yeah, so the trichotomy is either it's a disease or else you must be, you know, I think those people are horrible, um, you know, uh, lazy, self-indulgent pariahs who just, you know, are too busy uh, seeking pleasure to control themselves. No, that's not right. I don't think of addicts that way, having been one and having communicated with hundreds and hundreds of them on, in the last five or six years. I don't think that at all. I think that addiction is a really serious problem and it does destroy lives, but I don't think it's a disease. And I think calling it a disease 
doesn't add anything. It doesn't help us think about it. Doctors actually aren't very good at treating it. Medications aren't very good at, uh, at uh, controlling it. And uh, the whole rehab community in Britain, as well as in the US, is based on this notion that you've got a chronic illness. Something is deeply wrong with you, and we're going to give you, you know, what you need. We're not interested in what you have to say about it because we're the experts. And that's the first problem. We're the experts. So addicts lose the capacity to really think about, I want to change this, to feel the empowerment necessary to say, you know, no, I'm not, I'm not going to go this way. The trichotomy is it's either a disease or you're a nasty, self-indulgent person, or it's a choice. And often you hear in, in England, there was um, who was that guy? There were two brothers, one of them died. Um, one of your famous uh, TV, radio personalities. Um, um, it's not coming to me right now. So, who? Sorry? Yes, Hitchens. Oh, Christopher Hitchens. You're Hitchens. thinking about Peter Hitchens. Hitchens yes. the, uh, Peter Hitchens, My yeah. friend, yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. Is he? Don't worry, you can... <laughs> no, no, no. He's, uh, yeah. Well, he, he came up quite strongly and said, well, addiction is not a disease, therefore it's a choice, therefore, you know, we shouldn't be uh, indulging addicts and be so permissive about them because they're choosing to... Choosing pleasure over responsibility. He actually uses the word parasites in his book, The War We Never Fought, about, about addicts. Yeah. Okay, that, that, yeah, that follows. Um, and it's not that simple because choice isn't simple. I mean, choice isn't even simple for regular people. And it's certainly not simple for addicts because they're very attracted to something which gives them relief. And so choice is actually quite difficult. So it's not either a disease or a choice or a moral failing. It's something entirely different from all three. And so let's talk a bit about what it actually is. You have this, this description of addiction as a form of accelerated learning. Could you explain that concept? Yeah. Uh, okay, so I, I've been examining the neuroscience of addiction for about you know, five or six years. I, I've been doing neuroscience for about 20 years of my career. I got into doing it about, well, absorbing the neuroscience of addiction. There's a huge literature out there. And... Um, uh, Sorry, what was the question? <laughs> um, you're talking about the, the, how addiction is a form of accelerated oh, yeah, learning. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's hard to say exactly what addiction is. I mean, to me, it's sort of like asking, what, what is sex? Or, you know, what, what is uh, ownership? Like, there's actually no category that it fits nicely in. It's not some uh, type of, it's not a token of a particular type. It's rather a thing on its own. So, in my attempt to try to analyze it in a way that's neurally plausible, but also fits the behavior and social patterns. Um, it's a cycle that starts when you have, you seek something because it's highly attractive and it makes you feel better, and then you lose it because it doesn't last very long, whether it's drugs, booze, gambling, sex, porn, um, shopping. There's a quite a number of things that you can be addicted to. And then the cycle repeats itself because you feel lost and that's the thing that made me feel better, so you do it again, and you do it again, and you do it again. And this kind of cycle is necessary and important for all kinds of learning. And my kids are learning you know, piano and they have to repeat their scales because repetition you know, uh, bequeaths learning. But if the thing is highly attractive and highly motivating and highly emotional, then that really supercharges the system. And in terms of the brain, that means that you're, the part of your brain that's in charge of goal pursuit is sucking up dopamine from the undercarriage of the brain, the kind of chemical factory in the brainstem, and, uh, can, and continues to tune into this one reward. And the other potential rewards, family, movies, playing with your kids, pizza, become less and less charged with dopamine. The dopamine system gets tuned to that reward. And so the learning is accelerated. The cycle continues, it, it accelerates, uh, it happens first, well, often several times a week and then daily and then possibly even several times a day. And when there's nothing else to shoot for, no pun intended, you, uh, you, that's the only thing on the radar and you go back to it again and again. And another thing that increases the frequency is that it causes its own, it fuels its own need. Because it, most people um, pursue addictions because it makes them feel less depressed and less anxious, whatever it is. But after a while, the addiction itself makes you very anxious because well, it's fucking up your life. <laughs> and makes you feel more depressed because you're totally unhappy with yourself. And so you're producing the depression and anxiety, which you only know really how to get away from by doing it again. 
So the cycle tightens like a tightening spiral and locks you in. And there's a number of other brain processes and psychological processes that reinforce that, that pattern. And that's fascinating. I think that's so interesting, especially the point about it becomes that way if there's nothing else in your life. You give the example of, a, I think, a really important piece of social science that should be better known here in Britain, actually. Uh, Michael Chandler's work, I, I interviewed him recently. So as I'm sure many of you know, in Canada, they have a particularly high suicide rate among First Nations people, kind of the term they give the Native Americans, the survivors of the European, descendants of the survivors of the European invasion. A horrifyingly high suicide rate is a big issue there, but there's about... Uh, I think it's about 500 different um, tribal groups, First Nations tribal groups, and Michael Chandler, a social scientist, did this fascinating research where he, he noticed that there was actually a huge variation among the tribal groups. About So some, almost half had no suicides at all, and some had astonishingly high suicide rates. And he wanted to figure out why is that. And he did an enormous project of research that Mark explains uh, really well in the biology of desire. And what he found was that a single variable that was an extraordinarily tight correlation, which was um, the groups vary according to how much control they have. So there are some tribal groups where they fought really hard, they've revived their language, they control their police force, they control their fire services, yeah. they control their schools, and there's some tribal groups where they have none of that. Yeah. And it correlated almost exactly with suicide. The more control they had, yeah, yeah. the more they had in their lives, the lower the suicide rate. So how would you, you relate that to addiction in a really powerful way? How would you relate that? Yeah, I got to that in the last chapter of this book, which, yeah. by the way, is on sale at the back yeah. of the room. Um, because it, it sort of brought it all together for me. Uh, that work by Chandler with the Native communities brings together two really critical factors. One is the notion of empowerment. These, the... the um, let me go back a step. In, in the groups in the communities that had very high suicide rates, these researchers went in and asked the kids, these are like you know, teenagers, older teenagers, uh, what are you going to be when you grow up? What kind of career are you interested in? Do you want to have a family? Do you want to have kids? Do you want to, are you going to move? Are you going to stay here? They weren't able to answer the questions. They just said, well, I don't know. Well, we'll see. I don't know. They weren't able to think in terms of a future. And so, really, their lives were lacking any kind of shape, any kind of uh, narrative. Um, and, and you could take that in the other direction, too, because they didn't really have a narrative co connecting their present world to their past, to their traditions, to where do I come from? Where do my grandparents come from? What, am, what are we about? So they were just kind of stuck in this present tense, uh, which was, yeah, unconnected for the past or the future. Well, very much like an addiction. Addicts get into this kind of... Uh, um, eternal present where they really are only concerned with the today. This is what I'm going to do today. I'm going to get money. I'm going to get high. I'm going to get booze. This is how I'm going to hide it from my husband or my wife or my kids or whatever it is or the police. Um, so this issue of narrative is so crucial because if you can't make sense of your life, if you can't see your life as some kind of a story with a past and a future, then there's nothing to shake you out of that, that present tense. That present tense becomes, like, it just fills up all of your psychological space, I think. And the other thing, as you mentioned, was this notion of empowerment. The idea of having some control of your life. So in, in the low zero suicide communities, uh, as Johan said, there were tribal elders, there was a tribal council, there was a, a, a language and so forth. And so these guys, you know, continued to keep their own control of themselves. And of their culture, of their lives, of their, their vision, their perspective. In addiction, very often, especially, the subtitle of this book is Why Addiction is Not a Disease. Well, if you think that it is a disease, then um, all the control is uh, handed over to authorities, medical authorities, rehab authorities. And what do you do when you have a disease, right? I mean, you go to the doctor, you do what he tells you, he or she. And this is what happens with addicts in conventional rehabs that have a medical uh, uh, perspective. Uh, so, the addicts lose the sense that they themselves can take over their lives and move it in a direction that they, that they select, that they choose. And that's critical too. So you take these two things together, narrative and empowerment, and I think that is what is lacking in conventional treatment, is the capacity to uh, to reinforce and strengthen those, those elements. And I think those are the elements that are necessary for, for people to, to, get, to get over it.
Yeah, I got a message on my Facebook page uh, yesterday, actually, which I, I, I wrote out a bit of. I know you get these messages all the time. It was from a woman in a treatment sec- so-called treatment centre in Southampton, here in, here in Britain, in the south of, south of England. And she was talking about um, how, what she thinks her addiction is and what she's being told her addiction okay. is. She said, what pushed me over the edge into social drinking, into, into, into alcoholism, she asks. Well, I wasn't doing real socialising anymore. I was bored, I had no hobbies, I barely saw my friends. I hated where I lived in South London. I had no purpose, I had no fun in my life. Conversely, when I was out with friends, I found it very easy to have only one or two glasses of wine and then stop. It was being alone that was a catalyst for my drinking. And then she talked a bit about rehab and she said, all I'm told in rehab is that I'm chemically addicted for life and I'm powerless to stop that. I keep being told to find a higher power like God. Um, then when she argued with them, they said, she said, she explains, they said, don't be intellectually curious, it's dangerous, get down on your knees and pray each day for sobriety. Yeah. So what would you say to that woman? Well, it's very odd, this marriage between medicine and the medical you know, hierarchy and, and hegemony with the 12-step movement. It's a very odd kind of marriage, but it has become incredibly powerful, like a nod. I, I'm not one of these people who goes around bashing AA. Some people make a, a career of that, I, I don't. It's useful for some people, great. Um, but for a lot of people, indeed, you know, this notion of you have to give away your power, you have to recognize that you don't have any. If you did, you would stop and, you know, give it away to a higher power or to your sponsor or to medical authorities. And by the way, in the U.S., I don't know, I think it's close here, but in the U.S., about 85% of uh, residential rehab programs use 12-step methods as their primary approach. Well, they're not very effective. They're just not. The success rates are terrible. And people come back, they relapse from two to ten times. On the average, four or five times, they, they go back home, they start drinking or drugging again, and they come back and they go again and again. And in the U.S., that's how you use up all of your money and all of your family's money. I don't know if that's the case here as well. But well, and also you have court-mandated... Uh, yeah. I mean, I was just in New Hampshire and the... Um, you know, these, these women in a so-called drug court who are forced on pain of going to prison if they don't do it. Yeah. These women who've just been arrested purely for drug possession or addiction-related disorder, uh, problems, um, they're told, you have to go to this, relig- this explicitly religious program. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if you don't, if you, if you uh, fail at that program, by which they mean using any drug ever, yeah. uh, you, go in, you go to prison. Yeah. And these women, these women were really saying, but this is crazy, we don't... Th- this doesn't, be- yeah. doesn't apply to me. I don't believe that way. So the, the woman whose who's, um, statement you read, I mean, she sounds like, it sounds like she's in one of these typical uh, rehab programs in which the 12-step methods are dominant. And it's really unfortunate. There are some good things about AA, wouldn't you think? I mean, sure. the, the idea of community and, you know, what they call, what do they call it, brotherhood or... Um, fellowship. Fellowship, fellowship, yeah. fellowship, that's the word. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's... Really, and as, as Johann emphasizes in his writing, the opposite of addiction is not control. And this is one of the big problems with the rehab philosophy, both in and out of 12-step. The, the opposite of addiction isn't control, it's connection. It's connecting with other people so that you feel more okay, you feel some compassion and some warmth coming in and going out, and that makes you less uh, needy for something to fill you up. Well, so... The, you know, um, the, 12, the AA movement, which started in the 30s, they got this idea. And so the, uh, they said, okay, we're going to be together in a group and talk and listen to each other. And that's wonderful. That makes a lot of sense. The rest of it, I don't think it does much good at all, unless you happen to be a highly religious person, perhaps. And you, you, I want to come back to that in a little while, but you, you, so you, um, I want to talk about when people argue against you, what they say is, so we think about, for example, Nora Volkow, a very important figure. She's the head of NIDA, the National Institute of Drug Abuse, which funds 90% of all the research into currently illegal drugs in the world. In the world, yes. I mean, it's, she, and she's also the great-granddaughter of Trotsky, and she's slightly <laughs> less tolerant of dissent, I would say. Um, the, so what they say, one of the things they say, and this is crude and reductive, and to be fair, Nora Volkow would not say something as crude as this. But, they, but they, what many of them say is, look at this brain scan. So if you do a brain scan of an addicted person, you do a brain scan of a non-addicted person, they look significantly different. Right. What was the best way to respond to that? And they say, sorry, just the next step is they say, therefore it's a brain disease. Right. Yeah, I, d- I just had a debate with uh, Nora Volko, second in command, a guy named George Koop, who's the head of the, let's see, National Institute 
on alcoholism and alcohol abuse. I think that's what it's called. It's one of the segments of the NIH, the National Institutes of Health in the US, which is where all of these billions of research dollars are coming from, right? I had this debate with him on CBC Radio in Canada. It just, it just went on the air a few days ago. And <laughs> He really had my heart thumping because uh, I was quite nervous talking to him, partly because, well, I thought he was going to give a very s reasonable neuro argument. He's a very accomplished neuroscientist, and he didn't at all. What he said, he started off by saying, well, of course addiction is a disease because it changes the brain. I said, well, you can't be saying that. That's, I didn't hear that correctly. Everybody knows that the brain changes all the time. Everybody knows that neuroplasticity is kind of, this is the decade of neuroplasticity. So let's just stop and explain. So you give a great example, two great examples to illustrate that. One is uh, London, since we're in London, let's talk about it, London taxi drivers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the other is webbed fingers, which most London taxi drivers do not have. So could you, um, could you explain those two? I think they're good ways into understanding neuroplasticity. So, so think about, okay, think about all the ways, that we know the brain changes massively in development. Well, what does that mean? That means it's a highly flexible organ and it's supposed to change, and the more it changes in development, the more you become mature and efficient in your thinking and focused. Well, it, it doesn't just stop changing when you turn 20, it keeps changing. It changes when you fall in love, it changes when you become converted to a religion, if you're a jihadist, if you're a sports fanatic, if you're uh, a child abuser, if you're, um, you know, it, it changes all the time. So the, the issue with neuroplasticity first was a way of thinking about how brains recover following injuries, such as stroke or uh, a traumatic brain, brain injury. Um, and people recognize that after a stroke, you can recover a whole lot of function because parts that didn't do this before start to do that now because those parts aren't working so well. So we can hardly conceive of how plastic this organ is. It's like a lump of Play-Doh. You know. So the idea that brain change in itself indicates disease is just utter nonsense. Well, London cab drivers, that's, that's been around now for, for 20 years. The research shows that London cab drivers have their hippocampus, which is a memory part of the brain, um, is about 20%, 10 to 20% more, uh, uh, has higher density than other people, normal people. Why? Because they have to learn the locations of 50,000 streets or whatever it is. So it's all that learning which, in fact, makes their brains look differently. Well, if you're an addict and you do the same thing every day for a number of years, yes, your brain is going to change in accordance with those synaptic pathways that get reinforced by doing the same thing all those days. Something which is highly emotional, compelling, and attractive. But everything changes the brain. I've just been looking, this, looking at this stuff recently. Um, you know, uh, mindfulness meditation changes the brain. In very specific ways, it changes what's called the default mode network, um, which is a very important network for self-contemplation, self if you like. Uh, it changes it, and it's very visible on, on uh, brain scans after a certain number of meditation sessions. It looks different. Uh, it becomes deactivated, actually. And then I, I suddenly remembered that I spent about 10 years researching brain change following psychotherapy with, uh, with adolescents. Like, hmm. It suddenly occurred to me, wait a minute. This seems very familiar. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's odd how that happens. My, my career's gone through a number of uh, twists and turns, but we used to, we, we would do uh, EEG, that's uh, electroencephalogram recordings, dense array, that means you can see location as well as um, temporal uh, changes in the uh, patterns over time, before these kids started in a group therapy program to help them with their anxiety issues. And then three months later, and then six months later. And sure enough, we found changes, and we published them in respectable journals. Uh, so using the logic of the NIDA guy you were arguing against, it would make as much sense to say that psychotherapy is a brain disease exactly. as to say addiction is a brain disease. E exactly, yeah. Or driving a London taxi cab is... is um, is a brain disease. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's funny how I, I didn't think about this for such a long time, but we've, we found very, very uh, concrete changes after three to six months of psychotherapy for these kids. The brain is always changing. It changes when you learn music. I mean, this is the, the stuff by, what's his name? Um, sorry, I'm jet lagged today, so, uh, Levi, oh, um, David, oh, it doesn't matter. Um, everything changes the brain. So, so it's so, it was so disappointing that these, Neuroscientists at NIDA and the NIH still you know, hold to this rather ancient concept that the brain get, is, is a certain way and stays that way forever. It's just nonsense. And it seems, it seems really extraordinary. And there's, um, you put it to me very well uh, once when we were talking, I think, in Australia, where, where you said um, 
the, neither is not wrong to say the brain changes during addiction. Yeah. The error is to think that neuroplasticity ends at the point of addiction. Yes. That, that you then get fixed into this state and you're determined and then you're like that for life. Right. But you have talked about how synaptic pruning can lead to people feeling stuck. So could you explain that concept and then just how that is? So there is something going on there which yes. is more than just more than uh, memorising the map of London, equivalence and equivalence memorising the map of London. <laughs> so could you, could you just talk us through that synaptic pruning and then... Synaptic pruning, there are two, two mechanisms of brain change, really only two. So that's the growth of synapses and the pruning of synapses. It's the only thing that happens. Um, in development, you get a whole lot of pruning from middle childhood till late adolescence, um, which means that you are losing synapses. That sounds like a problem but it's actually a very good thing because you go from something like, uh, I don't know, what, 20 to 30 trillion down to about 15 trillion, which means you become a more efficient thinker. You're able to now focus better. Well, in addiction, the, the scientists who talk about brain change as evidence for brain disease often point to the fact that there's a reduction in synaptic density and the density of some synaptic net networks in very limited parts of the prefrontal cortex. That sounds pretty serious because, you know, it's really part of the brain that we quite like. We're, you know, it's there for our planning and judgment and perspective taking and uh, self-regulation. Um, but in fact, it is a way for the brain to become more efficient at whatever it's doing. Well, if what it's doing is going out and getting money and getting drugs and then doing this and doing that, then yes, indeed, you will lose some of the synapses that would stretch out to include other directions and other, uh, other sources of reward. I'm sorry, that's a great oversimplification. It, it also has to do with the way the dopamine system uh, recruits synapses in the striatum, in the motor motivational center, which then sends signals to the prefrontal cortex that says, that say, um, we need some control here from, you know, from the bridge of the ship. Well, it stops sending those signals as much when you no longer try to control your impulses. So there are real reasons why addiction is, in some ways, self-reinforcing, self-perpetuating, why it closes in on itself. It's a narrowing, it's, a, it's, a, it's an encasing kind of a thing. Um, but the brain only changes in, in relation to experience. So the best... <clears throat> The only drug, actually, that works for opiate addicts, and by the way, most addictions don't respond to any drugs. There's no drugs for cocaine addiction or methamphetamine addiction, and even the nicotine patch doesn't work very well for, for uh, tobacco addiction. But the only drug that works for, um, for opiate addiction is naltrexone, which actually closes down the opioid receptors and says, okay, we're not going to process any opioids. Well, if you're a heroin addict and you shoot heroin and nothing happens, you stop after a while. Okay, so that's great. Uh, does the brain change from that? Yes, it does. Does it change from the naltrexone? No. It changes from the fact that you stopped. Any way that you stop using is going to push the brain through, a number, through another cascade of changes to move forward, to change its focus, to change its uh, rigidity and so forth. It can come from naltrexone, it can come from cognitive behavioral therapy, can come from mindfulness meditation, motivational interviewing, uh, contingency management, there's like, you know, 10 kinds of therapy, it can come from AA as well. Anything that changes your pattern of behavior will change your brain wiring. So when this woman in this, in this um, rehab center in Southampton is being shown brain scans and told, this is what your brain is like, and this means you are an addict and you will always be an addict, yeah. and this is the state in which you will live, the vulnerability you will live with for the rest of your life, yeah. What would you say to the, the people running that centre who are saying that? <laughs> what would I say? <laughs> I'd, like, I'd, I'd be in the same room with them, first of all. Um, I would say that's ridiculous. The, the, the brain, you know, as I age, and, you know, I am definitely ageing, uh, I'm noticing a fair bit of brain change, as people do. When I had kids, I noticed a fair bit of brain change. I used to think that even their personality was a rigid structure. It's not at all. Your personality changes throughout your life, too. I used to be much more of a risk taker, more impulsive, more self-centered, and so forth. So this, this thing is changing all the time. Why would you imagine that it suddenly stops? How would you stop? You'd have to pour sand in there or something, and mix it up and let it harden. And just, I think there's a scene in one of the Hannibal Lecter films where he does that. But the, um, <laughs> just, to, just to say, there's a, another great example you give, which is the example of people born with webbed fingers who then get yeah, surgery. Yeah. Could you explain that? This is, this is a, 
kind of a simplistic example of neuroplasticity, but it's quite moving. By the way, this comes, um, a lot of this stuff has been written about by a guy named Norman Doidge, who's actually a Canadian author. He's a wonderful, wonderful author who writes about neuroplasticity and uh, guided neuroplasticity is a way that clinicians use to help people, well, not only who've had brain damage, but even people who have Parkinson's or uh, obsessive compulsive disorder. There's all kinds of ways in which you can guide neuroplastic change to help people get better, whatever it is. Well, the web fingers example is uh, interesting because some people are born congenitally, they have web fingers, that means they can't move their fingers independently. Uh, and when they do a brain scan, what they see is that the, uh, when you move this finger or this finger, it's the same set of cells that are firing, okay? Well, you could surgically cut the fingers so that they start to move separately. And when they start to move separately and you start to flex them separately, guess what? The pattern, that brain pattern, divides into two patterns. Now you've got one set of cells that controls this finger and another set of cells that controls that finger. And it happens within weeks. Within weeks, the brain adjusts itself according to a, a change, a, an alteration in behavior and in the way the behavior interacts with the world around you. Have you come across that crazy guy in LA who's trying to give people tails? Do you know about him? He's trying to give people he, what? He, he give people tails and wings. Do you know about this? And he, no. he draws on this evidence. Anyway, that's not relevant. Um, <laughs> but the, one of the, uh, the uh, great idea, though. It's the, it's the antithesis. Well, he, he he draws on those studies to say that your brain would, that your body would in fact adjust to to be able to control the wings and the tails. You're not joking, are you? No, no, I'm not joking. There's, there's a great piece about it in Harper's. Um, so, but I think one of the implications of what you're saying as well that I think is really significant and that you, that you, you draw out in the, in the biology of desire is the effect it has on people telling them... So according to this, uh, this trichotomy that you mentioned before, so clearly telling people that they're morally flawed, that's why they're an addict, the Peter Hitchens thesis, you're a parasite, right. we all know what effect that has, right? Yeah. That, we don't need to discuss that. It increases shame and... Uh, yeah, self, self. And makes their addiction worse. Yeah, you know, exactly. If I think about in Arizona, for, for my book I went, you know out with a group of women who were made to go out on a chain gang wearing t-shirts saying I was a drug addict and forced to dig graves while members of the public yeah, jeer yeah, at them. Yeah, yeah. It's not a coincidence, they have an exceptionally high relapse rate when you leave uh -huh. that program. I went to Vietnam, you know, where addicts are made to go in, into gulags, forced labour camps for months on end. And according to the Open Society Foundation research, 99% of them immediately relapse, right? Again, not surprising. Right, right. Also not surprising that if you look at the places that have really compassionate, caring policies, they actually have a reduction in addiction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but I think, I'm actually teasing out the implications of telling people um, that they're diseased mm -hmm. and the effect that has, as opposed to telling them this is a learned behavior that they can unlearn right. if they're given the right social support. Right. So what are the effects of that on, that, on this woman and on people like her? So you, you talk, by the way, that chapter in your book about the Arizona tent city, I mean, is so horrifying. Mm -hmm. I actually, I didn't believe you. I thought you were full of it. And I had to go and Google it and find that indeed yeah. there is this, this nasty prison. I found the site of that Sheriff, uh, what's his name? Yeah, he just, uh, uh, Sheriff Arpaio, Joe Arpaio, who's just, uh, just he's one of the leading right? endorsers of Trump. Oh, is he? <laughs> I'm not surprised. But, you know, they, they've shut down Tent City. It just happened in the last year or so, yeah, didn't yeah. it? Yeah, there have been moves to it. I don't think it's actually happened, has it? I thought it happened last December or so. Oh, I'll look into that. Arpeo, this guy Arpeo was, mm. I mean, well, anyway, that's another story, but um, the question is, what does it do to addicts to be told that they have a disease? Well, it, uh, what, what the people who support the disease model say is that we are helping them because we're removing stigma. We're saying it's not your fault. Um, this is the tri trichotomy again. What actually happens is that when you tell someone they have a lifelong disease built into them with genetic links um, and that is chronic, um, they feel permanently separated from the rest of the human race, first of all. You know, I'm this type of person with this type of problem. I will never be one, I will never be normal. I'll never be one of the rest of you. And as far as the addiction itself, the indication is that you are not going to be able to do anything about this because you have a disease. So people give up trying. Uh, they literally give up trying. And there's a number of studies that sh have shown that the belief in the disease concept itself is a powerful predictor of relapse. It's one of the two major predictors of relapse. I mean, think about that. So you, you take a bunch of people and you say, you separate them into those who believe that addiction is a disease and those who don't, and you look at them six months later. This is done with alcohol and methamphetamine, and I don't remember what else. Um, and those who believe in the disease concept relapse more frequently. So, you know, the rest of it, uh, and as far as the stigma issue, 
I don't think, you know, being told that you have AIDS or leprosy in the old days or whatever it is, uh, or schizophrenia, which, you know, makes you feel particularly good or uh, free of stigma. These are... You may have noticed there was some <laughs> stigma towards lepers at various points in history. Yeah, it's, 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 it's fascinating. And there's, a, there's that interesting study of this. I interviewed the woman, uh, I'm blanking on her name, who did a study. It's very interesting what they did. Uh, I might get some of the details wrong, but this is the gist of it. It's a study where they, they bring people in and they think they're just... Um, doing a, an experiment with another person and they don't know that the other person is in fact a confederate, an actor. And the person comes in and the confederate is primed. They both tell a story about their life and the confederate is... Half the time the confederate is primed to just tell a kind of banal story and the other half the confederate tells a story that he has either that he has um, a mental health problem because he has a brain disease mm -hmm. or oh, yeah, yeah. he has a mental health problem because he's been treated badly and life's been tough, yeah. right? Oh, sorry, Confederate's an actor, a person pretending, sorry. Um, the, uh, so, um, and, what they, and they're then brought in, and the first person, the person who's really the participant in the experiment, is then, uh, they're told, we're going to do a memory test. He, we're going to test his memory, and every time he fails, push this button, he's going to get an electric shock. And what they wanted to test was, would the person, would there be a difference between how willing you were to give an electric shock to someone who you thought had a brain disease versus someone, someone you thought was mentally ill because they had a brain disease versus someone you thought was mentally ill because they, because they'd been treated badly and had a rough life. And what they found is it wasn't a huge effect, but there was a significant effect. People were more likely to give electric shock, longer and more electric shocks to people who they thought had a brain disease, Yikes. which again reinforces the point you're making, doesn't it? Well, yeah, it's like, I mean, I think it's like there's something seriously wrong with you. You need to have some kind of perturbation, some kind of, uh, yeah, uh, um, uh, what's, it, what's the word? Uh, intervention is necessary. It accentuates the differences between yeah. us rather than the similarities yeah. and the yeah. idea that so we're all on a continuum. lack of empathy, a lack of compassion. And that we could all become addicted if we were sufficiently, our life sufficiently went to shit, you know. Well, this is the thing, and this is what Johan emphasizes in his book, and this, this um, the idea that addiction is, in fact, in many ways a social issue. It's a so social, interpersonal, and societal issue. Um, I mentioned before that people who become addicts have generally been through some sort of trauma and are suffering to some degree from anxiety and depression, so they do something to make themselves feel better. Well, that's not rocket science, right? But in general, we, we don't normally think of the larger pattern that people who are vulnerable in this way have, in some sense, been closed off, denied the opportunities that other people might have, whether they're victims of child abuse, or whether they're poor, or whether they are uh, suffering from... Um, whether they are minorities who don't have the same opportunities for advancement as other people. These are the kinds of walls that isolate people, and those are the people who are more likely to become addicted. And you make those points beautifully in your book, which is also for sale in the back of the room. Um, and one of the things that you also mentioned, and a number of people in the field are talking about, is uh, an experiment with rodents, which shows something very similar. And it's often nicknamed Rat Park. So what these um, researchers did, this is in British Columbia, another I'm a proud Canadian, uh, and so that's a, another great contribution that Canadians have made. Bruce Alexander showed in the 80s and 90s that when you give rats morphine, uh, then you give them a choice between more, consuming morphine versus just consuming plain water, morphine solution versus water. Rats will choose morphine, and they'll get themselves addicted. Everybody knew that. It wasn't surprising. It was predicted. Okay. However, if you take those rats out of their isolated steel cages and put them in a large wooden enclosure with a bunch of other rats so they can play and have fun and socialize, they actually give up the morphine, they prefer the water, and even those who have become physically dependent on the morphine go through withdrawal spontaneously, and in other words, uh, shall we say intentionally, um, because they don't want it anymore. They would rather play with their friends than do morphine. It's a wonderful, obviously, it shows that we humans aren't the only ones who actually require social contact. We need to be part of the big picture. We need to have opportunities. We need to move forward with our lives. We share that with other mammals as well, with all mammals. And addiction is the other side of that coin. And so a lot of people, when they hear about Rat Park, think, well, that's rats, we're not like that. It's worth knowing that there's a country that built their drug policies around the same principle. Yeah. So in the year 2000, Portugal had one of the worst drug problems in Europe. 1% of the population was addicted to heroin, which is kind of extraordinary. Yeah. Every year they tried the American way more, they arrested, they imprisoned more people, they shamed more people, and every year the problem got worse. And one day the Prime Minister and the leader of the opposition got together and said, well, 
we can't carry on like this, what are we going to do? And they did something that no one had done since the start of the drug war 70 years before. Yeah. They, were, they said, well, should we get some scientists to look at the facts? This is a really radical idea, right? <laughs> and they set up a, a panel of scientists and doctors to go away and look at the best evidence, including a lot of the stuff that we're talking about, and Rat Park. And the panel came back and said, decriminalise all drugs, from cannabis to crack, the whole lot, and take all the money we currently spend on arresting, imprisoning, shaming and stigmatising addicts, and spend it instead on turning their lives around. Right. And it, exactly as you say, it's not rehab, right? There is some residential rehab, long-term residential rehab, mm. and there is some psychological support. But the biggest thing they did was just making sure addicts had better lives. Right. So huge program of microloans, so addicts could set up and run small businesses about the things they cared about. Huge program of subsidized jobs. So if you used to be a mechanic, they'll go to a garage and they'll say, you employ this guy for a year, we'll pay half his wages. Mm. And the results are now clear. It's been 15 years since this happened. Injecting drug use has fallen by 50%, 50%. There has been no comparable fall in any other European country. So these principles, you know, they're, they're, whenever they're tried, they're, they're, they're really important. And I think just related to that, so we've talked, we've talked down some of the harmful forms of treatment, but I want to stress, in your writing, you, you constantly stress the positive models of treatment. So could you tell uh, the audience a little bit about smart recovery? Mm -hmm. Smart recovery kind of grew up as an alternative to AA, to 12-step. Um, it's free. These are groups of people that come in off the street. You don't have to sign up in advance. You don't have to pay for it. And they meet in, um, I don't know, community centers and uh, things, places like that. And they might meet once a week. And they sit around in circles, like in 12-step meetings. There's about, I went to one, there was about 15, 18 people there. And they use a more cognitive approach. They talk about what's going on with their addictions. Uh, they talk about the kinds of mental tricks that people can use to help them get past their addictions. These can be very helpful. For example, one thing, when I do uh, counseling or psychotherapy with addicts, I often say, look, when you start to think about it, just stop right away. Don't give yourself 10 seconds to consider the idea. Even though you know you're not going to go back there, just stop thinking about it right away. Right away, think about something else. Little things like that, silly little things like that can be really powerful. And they have the benefit of support. They, they talk and listen to each other. So they have that fellowship thing. And they also have now uh, imported mindfulness meditation. So they, they're now many of the groups are starting to do mindfulness exercises. And all these things are very helpful. So I don't know much about their success rates. I don't think they've done proper controlled studies yet. But I know it's very attractive to many people, especially people who really have had a hard time with AA and really don't want to go there. And my feeling is, I'd be really interested to know if you agree with this, I'm sure you do. In, when we think about AA, for something as incredibly complex as human addiction, mm -hmm. there should be a whole range of things on the menu. Yes. And one of them absolutely should be AA and NA and 12-step programs. Yeah. We don't want to take away anything that works from anyone, yeah, right? Exactly. And it, you know, it, it's really important that those models persist. They help some people. They've helped some of the people I love. All credit to them. Mm -hmm. But we, there is almost nothing complex in our society that we offer only one solution for. Right. Yes. And that we tell the person they're a failure if that one solution doesn't work. And I think yes. that's the real, the real danger, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, in, in, in one of the, in my book, I've got stories, I've got biographies of five addicts, and that really is a bulk, the bulk of the book, is I follow these people very closely, I interviewed them intensively over Skype, and one of them, uh, so they're a heroin addict, a meth addict, uh, this and that, one's even a binge eating disordered person, and one of them is an alcoholic, and he happens to be a British man, and so his story might be of interest to, to you folks, but I think he actually started in a residential re he oh man he had it bad he would have these cycles of uh, he would wake up he would he would go right to the fridge before he went to pee um, pour himself a glass of rum have it on the way to the toilet have another glass of rum right away and keep drinking and drinking and drinking until he just fell unconscious so he'd have these four hour days his days lasted for four hours he'd fall down he'd crawl to the bed he'd fall asleep and then he'd start again it was horrendous. Very close to death by the time he uh, checked into rehab. And it was a residential rehab that did use 12-step methods. It got him going. After that, he saw a psychiatrist. He spent three months with a psychiatrist. Then he went to a social worker. Then he got an addiction counselor to see him once a week for a year. Then he, got a yo he went to yoga instruction. He started doing yoga. He started doing massage. He started doing meditation. He was smart enough to realize that, you know, there's a spectrum of things out there. And take what you can get and put it together in a package that works for you. So, yeah, I think that's really important.
I'm going to go to audience questions in a minute, so if you guys have a little think. I, I, I wanted to ask one more question myself, which is, I think one of the many fascinating things you cover is this question of uh, addictions to things other than drugs, and I include within drugs alcohol, right. um, and what that reveals about the nature of addiction. So could you, you mentioned obviously one of the studies in, in, um, in the biology of desire is a binge eater, you, you've talked about gambling addiction, we've yeah. talked about a bit of it backstage. Right. What, do, what, do, what do they reveal to us, those addictions? Well, we know that there, there are a lot of similarities in behavior. People get themselves into these ruts and have a terrible time. Porn addictions uh, can be quite serious, can certainly wreck marriages and sex addictions, obviously, get, get people in trouble. The whole gamut, the behavioral profile is very similar. But what's amazing is that the neural profile is also almost identical. When you do mm. fMRI, when you do brain scans on people with behavioral addictions, and there's several conferences now, there's a Society of Behavioral Addictions, um, they, uh, it's the same thing. There's, there's uh, intense dopamine uptake to the striatum, there's an organ of goal pursuit. When you are exposed to cues that uh, are associated with the thing you're addicted to, whether it's sex, porn, or heroin, it doesn't matter, okay? And so then you get more rapid synaptic changes in that region, you get desensitization to rewards more generally, and you get a shutdown, you actually get this reduction in synaptic density in the prefrontal cortex. You get this with obesity. I mean, it's amazing to think that the brain profile of somebody who falls into binge eating and obesity, or obesity, uh, goes through the same brain changes as someone who gets addicted to meth or heroin. They just look indistinguishable. So, if you say that addiction is a disease which is caused by drugs, and that is, in fact, the party line of NIDA, of the NIH, and, and all the rest of this, this group, um, it just doesn't hold up. Drugs can't be the cause, because all of these addictions look the same. They act the same, and they change the brain in the same way. That's totally fascinating as well, because, of course, the United States has spent a trillion dollars trying to physically eradicate drugs, yeah. based on the principle that that's the problem, yeah, right? Exactly. We, we arrest yeah. enormous numbers of people in this country with an even worse racial disparity in the arrest than the United States, actually. Really? Yeah, yeah we're the only country that has a work, which means that basically no white people are ever arrested for drug offences in Britain. I mean, it's pretty close to that. Uh, overwhelmingly, they're, they're, they're black. Um, the oh, yeah. only, so the US has a much worse racial disparity than apartheid South Africa did at the heart of apartheid, yeah. at the height of apartheid, wow. and we are worse than them. Just to give you some sense of that should be a big part of our debate as well, which touch on things we haven't, we haven't touched on. But okay, let's come back to that, but I've got lots more questions if you guys haven't, but do, does anyone have a question? Let's start with the women, since we're now in an era where we are ruled by women. Uh, so yeah, there. Hi, I'm Hi. Do you want to stand up? I think it would be easier for people to hear, if that's all right. Unless, oh, there's a microphone, so. Hi, everyone. Um, hi, Mark. Um, I'm in a 12-step programme, and uh, I feel demonised by suggesting that maybe I could drink again or use again uh, socially. Um, I want to know, like, is, am I completely banned from it? Is, is it possible for me to drink again, uh, normally? The, the stats say that up to 50% of people who have been classified as alcoholics of uh, alcohol abuse disorder... Um, can drink again socially, 50%. Okay, so now, are you part of that 50% or not? I mean, how do we know, right? Uh, so the only way you can really know, I think, is by waiting a safe period, and it's, I think, you know, total abstinence is probably a good idea for a while, and then, you know, you could maybe explore a little bit. Obviously, be careful and have some safeguards in place so you're not gonna fall back in in case you're not part of that 50%. And how long, how long would you suggest is a safe period? I mean, how long should the period of abstinence yeah. be? I don't know. That's a hard <laughs> question. It depends on you, right? It depends on the circumstances. I think also the evidence depends on what's happening in your life. So if we think yeah. about Portugal, you know, if you were one of those women who left that horrific prison in Arizona who goes out, you'll never work in the legal economy again, you're going back to a violent partner, mm. you can't get, even get food stamps because you've got a criminal conviction for drug uh, possession, well then I would very strongly advise you not to try drugs again because the odds are your life is so shit yeah. that if you take it you're not going to want to stop. Yeah, now yeah, if you were exactly, in Portugal yeah. where you're given a huge amount of support, love, you're in a society that regards you as someone who deserves to have a good life, then I think after a very long period to be cautious, you might feel comfortable having a drink again. But I think these are not general rules. It's really complex. It's really personal. And I, I appreciate that it's very... I, I'm conscious that when we talk... And I've had this with my ex-boyfriend who um, had a very bad drug problem and was very uncomfortable with some of the things that I said. And it was... Mm -hmm. 
appreciate that when we talk about these things, we need to do them very carefully because we're talking about ideas that are what keep some people alive. Yeah. And right. it's why when we talk it's about the true. range of responses, there are some people who are being told, you don't need to be abstinent, will be a catastrophic message, right? Mm -hmm. And it might even kill them. There are other people who are being told, you can never use a drug again, Whatever and you're just going to have to be abstinent for your whole life. That kills them. Because there's something called the relapse violation effect, which is that if you think you've got a brain disease and you know, any relapse will lead to inevitable descent into you know, lying in the gutter, mm. then actually that belief becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Now, of course, it would be true for some people yes. otherwise. But, so th there's risks on both sides of this argument. We need to proceed very carefully, but we need to do it in a spirit of accepting that we all want to reduce addiction and we all need to look at the best facts and just recourse to a kind of religious worldview, which is very tempting. I don't know, particularly when you're vulnerable and you're in those early stages, what you want is absolute certainty. You don't want someone going, oh, here's five different scientific papers. You can, you know, if you fuck that, I want to know, tell me what to do. So I entirely understand, I apologize if what we're saying is upsetting. I think ultimately it does more harm if we don't have an honest and open conversation. But to be honest, I think people who are in the very early stages of recovery shouldn't, probably shouldn't be using anyway. And you probably, this is not the time for you to be having this conversation. You know, uh, that's not that helpful. But what you do need is a huge amount of love and support to reconnect with all the things that give life meaning. And I hope, I hope you're getting that. And, and, and just, yeah, to mention, like, when I, when I got off opiates around the age of 30, um, for 20 years I took nothing, not even a codeine tablet for a toothache. Um, and uh, in the last six years, I've had a couple of, of, of uh, surgeries, spinal surgeries that you know, I had a lot of pain before, during, and immediately afterwards. So I was taking opiates again, strong opiates for pain. Well, you know, there was some temptation. There was a feeling, of, yeah, I really do like this feeling. This, I remember this feeling really well, and I like it. Well, that's kind of a dangerous thing, so be careful now. At one point, I gave my wife my pills and said, you know, just make sure I just take, you know, the three a day that I'm supposed to. And then I had to say to the doctor at one point, okay, I'm done. I could do that, but it's graded, you know, it's not just black or white. So even, and I think even though, Johan, as you say, the, um, it, it's a really serious, critical life and death matter for some people, in another respect, we can lighten up a bit, and be a bit more flexible. Most addictions don't lead to death. Most addictions may lead to relapse and recovery, and relapse and recovery, and changing your life, and changing your habits, and maybe changing your partner, but, it's not necessary. <laughs> Works for my ex-boyfriend. <laughs> uh, <sorry. laughs> so anyway, that's, that's the sort of... And I think initially, just to say one more thing about that, if you don't mind, the, 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 I think that's an interesting... So this, you've gone to, I think, the hardest thing for us to answer, frankly, right, which is the debate about abstinence. No, rightly, it's, it's really helpful that you brought it up. And I think one interesting model for looking at this is o OA and, um, so Overeaters Anonymous and Sex Addicts and, uh, sex and Love Addicts Anonymous, right? Because obviously, they're interesting because they're the 12-step model, but obviously they don't recommend that you, obviously Overeaters Anonymous don't recommend you never eat again, right? <laughs> obviously. And Sex Addicts Anonymous don't recommend you become a nun, right? So those are models where you use the 12-step program, but it's to get you back to a healthy relationship with the thing. And no one regards that as controversial yeah, yeah, yeah. with yeah, Sex yeah. and Love Addicts Anonymous, yet we do regard it as controversial with alcohol and, and other drugs. And I think there's something interesting to be teased out that I don't quite know what it is and I haven't thought about it before. Do you feel we've answered your question? Yeah. Do you? <laughs> I appreciate it's not. I'm sorry, I think this is a really, I think it's really important that you brought it up. So I'll go to another, um, where's the microphone? Oh, yeah, okay, did you want to ask a question? Sorry, can I just, yeah. Um, I'm really glad to be here and I'm glad people are looking at addiction in another way. Sorry, really glad to... Be here and to have people investigating addiction in different ways. Good. I find it incredibly shocking and I've had a lot of trouble with the 12-step model. Just the giving power away, get down on your knees and pray. I'm just like, fuck off, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. And a I lot think, of people respond that and way. And they're going, oh, it's not religious, it's spiritual. It's like every time you question something, there's a new answer. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I found, I've witnessed violence in meetings. There's a lot of really, really unwell people. Um, there's just things that I didn't agree with. And then I found my solution in, you know, doing yoga and meditation and things. And I think they've helped me more than actually the 12-step program. Just meditation and yoga. Yeah. 
you know, things that are about connecting to ourselves. I wasn't sure if you said meditation or medication, so. Oh. <laughs> it's American. They can't, it's Canadian. They can't understand thing, what we're saying. It can be useful. <laughs> but I do, I really believe in, you don't run away from things. If You don't want to be disassociated if you're comfortable. Yeah, exactly. So, exactly. I, I'm, it's just very refreshing to hear people um, with a different opinion. Good. And that we make our own choices and we don't give our power away. Yeah. I yeah. think this is the problem of the first world today is all of this giving our power away to doctors. We've given our power away to teachers. We've given our power away yeah. to our boss. We've yeah. given our power away. And it's like, actually, self-empowerment is what heals you. Yes. Um, and self-actualization. So, yeah, I'm, I'm really pleased to be here. Thank you. Well, thank you. And congratulations on, on what you said as well. Yeah. Um, so should we go to the, the guy, this guy in the second row, just, just behind you? Thank you. Hi. Hi, Jan. Hi, uh, Mark. Um, Wait here, lady. Hey, Jan. Hey, Mark. Um, I just finished reading the um, um, biology of desire, and um, I love the whole analogy of the motivational core. Um, Could you mind moving the microphone a bit closer to your mouth? I yeah, sure. Hear. Sorry. So, Thank you. I'm, I'm fascinated by the... Has anyone looked at the actual um, neuroscience behind the 12 steps? Because to me, the um, 12 steps is a vehicle for enabling synaptic change to occur such that you remove the old associations. So for me, for instance, six years ago, sunshine equal drink or cocaine, um, work equal stress equal cocaine, um, everything led back to cocaine. And... What I have, I hate the God part of the 12 steps, but to me, steps one through three is all about being honest, and I was never honest previously, so that's new, so that's putting down new pathways. So, so step one, two, and three are about... Admitting you've got a problem. And, admitting you have a problem, you know, yeah. I, 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 don't, I don't buy into the God in a religious sense, but for right. me, God was the science. I knew someday someone like yourself would talk sense about the whole thing. Okay. But, but, but <laughs> I... I what, what I suppose what my question is, has anyone looked at the actual neuroscience behind the 12 steps, eliminating the specific God parts of it and viewing it through the lens of it's a vehicle for enabling synaptic change to occur um, because you're forced to do new things and yeah, yeah. you're forced to do them repeatedly, rep repeatedly and hence that's got to lay down new pathways that remove old associations. Um, has anyone actually looked if there's anything in well, that? I, I, I don't think they have specifically with res respect to with the 12 step programs. First of all, those, those people aren't really open to that kind of research. And they're not, I mean, the only way you can do that kind of research is with RCTs, randomized control trials. So they're not going to do that. They're not going to, you know, have a randomly subdivide a group into you guys take the program and you guys don't. They're just not into that. So, well, sorry? It's an, she's saying it's anonymous. It's anonymous yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's okay. We don't mind giving people numbers, right, instead of names. But we don't want to say that. It's anonymous. They can't report their members. They can't offer their members for research. There's a reason why there isn't very good control studies among yeah, Did everyone hear that? Yeah. yeah but that, that should... Oh, sorry. She was saying that the nature of uh, these programs is they're anonymous and therefore they can't volunteer their members and that obviously presents an obstacle to researchers. I don't think so. That's, yeah. that's the main thing though because people can... You can they have done research in 12 step Yes, they have. Yeah. They were members of 12 step fellowships. But they don't... They, yeah. yeah, but they don't do randomized controlled trials which is a particular well-controlled kind of research for, look, for really testing but, what, what's... Mm. Anyway, my, my, my point isn't really that. It's, uh, I, don't, I don't know of, of that specific research, but in, in response to your question, I think that anything that's, that changes your behavior will change your brain. So, I mean, if, if you get put in a room, you know, locked in a room for six months without access to anything, this is what naltrexone does for opiate addicts. Naltrexone, you keep someone on naltrexone for six months, they stop taking opiates because they have no effect. Antabuse will do that for alcoholics if they keep taking it except for a few really determined ones who will take, still drink and get sick, right? But anything that changes your behavior will change your brain. So when that happens in a 12-step program, whether it's for three months or six months or a year, a lot of people don't last very long. They quit, you know, for possibly the sorts of reasons we've been hearing about. But if they stay and if they stop, that will indeed change their synaptic networks. It so there's, there's loads of people who want to ask, so I, I can't, we can come up to us at the end, and, if that's okay. Thank you. So uh, where's the microphone? Oh, great. Thank you. So should we go to, um, there's a, another woman just in this row here, and then I'll go nearer the back um, for the next lot. Thanks. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Hi. I've been in 12-step for many years, and I've been lucky enough to not take drugs or alcohol for over 12 years now. Um, however, I, I believe that that environment allowed me to train myself not to do so. To shrink yourself, did you say? Train, train yourself. Train. Yeah. I, so I'm sorry, I, I'm a Canadian living in the Netherlands who just <laughs> arrived in England. I'm just trying to figure out you know, what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> We're basically like the adults in Charlie Brown. Na -na 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 -na. <laughs> Yeah, so, sorry, keep going. I still got kind of self-destructive behavior in the moment, and uh, I feel made in different ways in my life. So I was just wondering if, I believe there is nothing wrong with me, however, I still go into that behaviors. So the question is, is some sort of neuroplasticity has to change, or do I have to force myself into not to do it in order to train and create new habits? Because I believe alcoholism or any addiction is a habit. But that's it's just really my fascinating. personal belief. I think, this really speaks, I think this really speaks to a part of your book where you talk about things that wire together, fire together. Yes. Sorry, things that fire together, wire together. Yes. So she's talking about, uh, if, if I understand correctly, uh, uh, she's someone who's been in recovery for 12 years, yes. has been abstinent for 12 years, yes. still feels some of the cravings she felt before, but not at a huge risk. And mm. how can she retrain herself? And I thought it might be relevant to talk about the okay. wiring, firing... Okay. Nexus. Okay, so you're still getting cravings, basically. No, I, I'm, oh, not, sorry, I I'm not using that. any substances at the moment. Sure. However, some of my behaviors are not very healthy for me. So I still eat compulsively, for example, and I eat, go into self-destructive right. behaviors from time to time. Oh, right, so she still I, has not, some compulsive behaviors like eating compulsively. Oh, I see, okay. Right, right. I'm not so, into 12-step so, okay, program anymore. Okay, so there's some anymore. shifting so We've all got a bit Jerry Springer, haven't we? It's, uh, <laughs> sorry about that. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> um, you know, Thank you. there is often, there's some movement from one addiction to another to another. I mean, people who have an urge to get something into them, uh, if it can't be alcohol, maybe it'll be food. Well, and Bill if, Wilson, founder of AA, yeah. then smoked himself to death, well, didn't exactly. he? And became a compulsive sex addict. Yeah, exactly. So, so yeah. And, and you know, AA is famous for the cigarettes and coffee consumption. So as long as you're putting something in, you might feel a little bit better than mm -hmm. if you put nothing in. I think the hardest thing in recovery is to feel that you're empty. You feel, I can't put anything in myself. It's just, I'm just this big vacuum. I think that's really difficult. And that's why I think addiction is a, it's a very deep, fundamental belief about oneself, one's body, and the world. You know what I mean? It's, it's the belief like at the level of a two or three year old. He says, well, I get my good stuff from mama, or I don't. You know, it's like I'm this receptacle, and this is how I get my good stuff. Well, you know, if you're an addict, you probably believe that you're a receptacle, and you get your good stuff from alcohol or narcotics or whatever it is. Um, or sex, and, and it's really hard to shake that down to its foundation. So I think in a way you have to be compassionate with yourself when you have cravings, when you shift from one thing to another, pick whatever's least destructive, let yourself have a little bit of slack, and you know, go on with your life. If it's not killing you, well then it's not killing you. I th but I also think, there's, if you don't mind, if, if, no, no, no. Uh, Bruce Alexander, who did the Rat Park experiment that we were talking about, he's a friend of ours, he says, we talk all the time in addiction about individual recovery that has real value, but we need to think much more about social recovery. Mm, yeah. Something's gone wrong with us, not just as individuals, but as a group. And I think if we want to find the paths out of addiction for many people, and for as many people who are addicted, there are people who are depressed or feel like shit in other ways, I think, um, I think we have to look at the underlying causes of why we feel so bad. We have an increasingly insecure society. We have collapsed social bonds. We have a war on drugs. I've written a book about that one. <laughs> the, um, the, <laughs> just random angry words now. Um, the, no, but I think, so I think we need to look much more. So the temptation is, and, and you said at the front, and I, I totally understand why, and I agree with you about, you know, it's about self-actualization, but I also think it's about collective actualization. Broken up, isolated individuals yeah. doing shitty, yeah, meaningless yeah. jobs, feeling like shit, ever more insecure, are going to be much more vulnerable to addiction. Yes. But if we band together and change that, as human beings have many times, to demand the rights that we all share. We have a woman prime minister today. We didn't get that by accident. Women fought for those rights. You know, I'm gay, I can get married. Didn't happen by accident. Not that I'm not holding up Theresa May as an example of progress, but you know what I mean. The, you know, the, the, so I think it's about a collective fight to improve conditions for all of us, not just all of us individually thinking, what's wrong with me? There's one person who said, we, we're always told we need insight, we need outside. <laughs> You know, anyway, sorry, that was a rant. Uh, so um, I'll go right to the back. There's a guy at the back row. Hi. Yeah, thank you. Um, 
Yeah, many addictions start because there's an underlying problem. Um, and then, of course, the addiction itself prevents us from maturing and dealing with the problem. Yeah. I think NA and the anonymous groups, they don't uh, um, go on to address the, that once you abstain, it's just the beginning. You, you then yeah. have to work, do a lot of work on yourself, providing your addiction was related to an initial problem. And of course, not all addictions are. Some people, it's because their mates started smoking cannabis and then they moved on to harder things. So I'm not saying all addictions, there's an underlying uh, problem. But um, I think um, intuitive thinking is a very good course. I haven't... Yeah, I, mean, I, I think, um, again, it doesn't go on to address the, the, the problems, the fact that abstaining and saying no is just yeah. where you begin the process of um, moving forward with your life and, and the hard, hard work. Yeah, of, my, my understanding is that in AA groups, I've been to a few as a guest, but that's all, um, is that they often discourage people from talking about their problems as though it's some kind of, uh, you know, diversion. Um, and, and they don't want to hear about it. No, let's just focus on your addiction because that's the main issue. I'm not making this up. This, I've gotten this information from a lot of people. Um, f for me, it was, I, first of all, I quit. Then I actually went into uh, insight psychotherapy, psychoanalytic psychotherapy for about 10 years. And I learned all the things that had sort of you know, pushed me towards addiction and made it so easy for me to become an addict. But I don't think I could have done that the other way around. And people who go into psychoanalytic therapy, for example, um, to learn why they feel the strong desire, that's not very effective either. So I agree with you. I think the formula is first slow down, stop, let yourself start to what people say nowadays in, the, in this sort of new treatment movement that we're, I think, both connected to, is uh, to um, calm the chaos that your, your life, if your whole life is spent seeking drugs or booze, then you're living in a tremendously tense and difficult situation. And you don't have room to think about where did this come from? How did I get this way? So you can, if you can reduce the chaos, get clean or get, or at least reduce your use, harm reduction for a while, then you can start to consider how you got this way and what you might want to do to make sure that you don't go back. On, on the subject... Okay, so we'll, we'll go to... Um, I think okay, there's so many people who want to ask, if you don't, if it's okay. Uh, okay, so there's a guy in the row just here, if that's okay, in a red uh, tie. Hi. Uh, yeah. Um, the, in, it, like, I've, I've been told you can be born an addict or be born with a disease of addiction, and the, the, the way I had it explained to me is if you have a brother and sister that go through the same things and one becomes an addict and the other one doesn't become an addict, that shows that their disease of addiction is present in the person that becomes an addict. I want to know, I was wondering what you, what, how, how would you explain that one becomes an addict and the other one doesn't become an addict? Thanks. So with the genetic propensity to addiction, you want to deal with that? Right. Um, yeah. There's, behavioral genetics is a really messy area. The first thing to, to know is that there is no such thing as an addictive personality. It's just utter bullshit. However, there are genetic links. For, and I'll explain why. The genetic links, have the, what, what, what genetics connect to is personality patterns. And some people have an impulsive, risk-taking personality style, and that can be genetically shared with a, with a parent and obviously a sibling. Okay, so if you're more of a risk-taker, you're more likely to try drugs, and if you're more likely to try them, you're more likely to get addicted. On the other hand, if you're a more anxious person, more prone to depression, more likely to be vulnerable to social rejection, you're also more likely to become an addict. So those are completely opposite personality traits that both uh, increase the propensity toward addiction. And they're both genetically linked. Now, what behavioral genetics does is it picks up all of these little bits of variants and adds them all together and says, see, addiction is 50% heritable. But it doesn't work like that. It's just it's that... Anything, if you're, if, you're, if you're really ugly, you probably have a higher propensity to become an addict, you know, or if you have bad allergies or, you know, um, uh, I don't know, big feet. I mean, you take all this stuff and you combine it together and you can get a pretty big figure that uh, there is some linkage with someone else in your family. Add it all together, you get this 50% rate. It doesn't mean what people think it means. You're not doomed. It doesn't, 
no one person is 50% predisposed towards addiction because of their parents, because of their familial uh, 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 heritability issues. And I think, speaking to the, the question about disempowering or dangerous things to tell people, I'm really glad you asked yeah. this, that is a wicked thing to tell people. You know, one of my earliest memories is of trying to wake up one of my relatives and not being able to, we had addiction in my family. Um, yeah. It's flatly untrue that anyone is born an addict. Anyone who says that does not understand what the word addiction means yeah. or what addiction is at the most basic level. And that is being told to lots of people in so-called treatment centres yeah. across Britain. And that yeah. is shocking. Is there a place for that, though, as well? Is there, is there a place for that? Because you're preaching to converted here, absolutely, totally, unnurtured. No, no, no. I'm not sure we are, actually. I think this is a live debate. Oh, sure, sorry. Oh, sorry. That's an interesting question. Did everyone hear that okay? So the, uh, the woman at the back made a really interesting point where she said, is there a place for saying uh, that some people are more genetically vulnerable because it might be helpful for them to know that? Um, do you want to answer that, Mark? Again, I think it goes back to the idea of an addictive personality. And, and I think it's so easily uh, misunderstood. So, okay, if, if you're... <laughs> Maya Salovitz is another person in our little group of maybe hopefully more progressive thinkers about addiction. She's written a wonderful book called uh, Broken, Broken Un Brain. Unbroken Sorry, Brain. Unbroken yeah. Brain. Um, and <laughs> so there's two genetic predispositions. One is more impulsive, risk-taking type, and the other is a more uh, neurotic, uh, um, anxious, shy type. She said she had both in her family. And she became an addict for a few years, and then she stopped. And, wrote, and she's been an expert in the area ever since. The thing is, these factors combine in all kinds of ways. Sometimes destructive ways, sometimes constructive ways. I met a guy in, in New York, his whole family, everybody in his family was an addict. His parents met in a methadone clinic. Uh, I mean, you know, his, uh, his brothers were all heroin addicts. It was everybody, he had never tried drugs, uh, ever. And why? Well, you know, he was kind of scared of them. Good reason, huh? But why would he manage to do that? So there's this combination of factors of genetics and what you learn socially through your life and how you respond to tragedy and difficulty and your, all these things. Nobody can say in advance, this is the kind of danger that you face because your parent is X. An interesting way to think about this in terms of social, social factors versus inherited genetic factors. Think about something where there's about a 90% heritability, which is height, right? Under slavery, African Americans were considerably shorter than white Americans. They're now, as everyone knows, a fair bit taller, right? Really? Nothing changed in their genes. Michael Marmot, a professor here, writes about this very well. Think about obesity, right? We all know there's a genetic component to weight, right? Some people like me find it really easy to put on weight. Some bastards find it really hard to put on weight, right? <laughs> but we also know if I went and lived in Texas, I would become fatter. And if I went and lived in Bangladesh or Somalia, I would become thinner. That's a very good the point. social factor trumps the genetic factor if the social factor is sufficiently large. And so we interact. all know that there's far more fat kids now than there was even when I was a kid. Could you? Can we give her the microphone? Because it's really interesting. Sorry. She's just giving you. The... Oh. Well, we're not saying there's no genetic component. There's a mistake that often people make, which say, well, it ran in my family, therefore it was genetic. Everyone here, well, there's probably a few exceptions, but almost everyone here, your parents spoke English, right? It ran in your family, it's not genetic, right? So there's often that common, that common right. conflation that's right. between genes and... Now, it's not to say there isn't a genetic component. Actually, there's a genetic component to language, as Noam Chomsky has shown, but there's... there's, um, there's but, you know, there are... But, but it's... Let's not go there. Um, the, the, but, so... We're not saying there's no genetic component. What we're saying is, saying it's all genetics, which is what this guy seems to have been told, people are born addicts, that is toxic. That's a terrible thing to have told a human being, because it's a lie, firstly. And secondly, what does that say to you? You were born an addict. And also, you know, the genetics interacts with your environment, obviously, from before birth. Yeah. I mean, the stress that your mother is, is uh, having to deal with while you're in the womb is going to affect the neurochemical wash that goes through your body while your brain is being formed. So genetics are never, ever isolated from experience. Uh, can I continue one sec? There's a woman I've been, promised, I've been indicating with my eyes that I would go to, and I promise I'll go to you next. The, um, just the woman in the second row. Hi. Yeah. She didn't pick up on my eye signals. It's the story of my dating life. 
<laughs> I think we're a bit old for you, actually. <laughs> and the wrong gender, but hey. Uh, I just wanted to go back to what um, Professor Mark Lewis said about the uh, disease um, concept, because I think we've got a lot of um, problems around the way the medical profession regards addiction. Mm. And part of that is the fact that disease is thought of as individual. So each patient yeah. is an individual and not thought of in terms of their family or their um, family of origin or the people that they're living with now, when in fact the 12-step uh, programme is a family programme. As the way I see it, you know, it doesn't work individually. It has to work with other people around you taking on the 12 steps as well. Because, you know, it's all very well for a wife to say to her husband, you always do this, you always do that, when she's not looking at herself. So, you know, that's a lesson I learned anyway. And also that um, if the medical profession are giving you medication, what does that say about the way we live our lives? You know, they're trying to get you addicted to their medication. So what's the difference? And people quite well, rightly have a criticism about that. Yeah, but there's, that, there's a know. difference between, you know, being able to go get your medication for the pharmacy than having to go to the shittiest part of town and getting it from a criminal. Exactly. Uh, yeah. I, yeah, but it's still an addiction. I would say one addiction. is just, just basically fundamentally better than the other. <laughs> But, but, you know, these are really complex issues. Let's not simplify it too much. Yeah, of course, the and as Johan said, the family and the community and the society, these are um, spheres within spheres within spheres, and they all interact to produce the phenomenon of addiction in, yes, what we always identify as the individual. But I, I, I do disagree with you about... Uh, I think we have to talk about it in concrete terms. So to give very one quick one example, and I promise to come to you. The, the, so Switzerland had a big... Um, heroin problem, uh, and they tried all sorts of things and it, all, and it kept producing disasters. And what they did, starting in the year 2000 in some experiments and then spread it out, was they legalized heroin for addicts. So the way it works is I went to these clinics for, for my book, that you, you go to the clinic, you're prescribed heroin there, you can't take it out with you, you have to use it there in front of the, the nurse or the doctor. Yeah. Um, and then you leave and you go to your job, because they help you get jobs, they get you housing, they help you to turn your life around. That program's now been running, it's, that program's now been running, yeah, so since the year 2000, whatever that is now, 16 years. Do you know how many people have died of heroin overdoses on legal heroin in Switzerland? No. Nobody. Not a single person. You compare what a massive chunk of our deaths was heroin last year. Um, so I think it's really important to not stigmatise harm reduction programmes. Of course, we'd wish we could all, everyone who's got a drug addiction problem could wake up tomorrow with a happy, contented life where they didn't want to use drugs. Yeah. That's not going to be the reality for lots of people. Yeah. For lots of people, they're going to have to taper off over a very long period. And you know, there's going to be some people yeah. who never stop. Yeah. And they still have a right to be alive. And they still have a right to be healthy. That's and they right. still have a right to be loved. And we shouldn't stigmatise them by just saying, you're still, addi you're still addicted, therefore yeah. you're... I, mean, I know that's not what you would do. So I don't want to sound like I'm accusing we feel, you. Because we feel fine about prescribing huge amounts of antidepressants presence to people yeah. for indefinite periods, so there's nothing... Prescribing yeah. methadone or buprenorphine is no different. And it's the antidepressants don't work, at least, at least heroin does. <laughs> so, anyway, that's another debate. Oh, yeah, right. I, uh, um, I just want to um, add, because we were getting quite uh, passionate earlier, about the environmental factors, uh, which uh, a really good scientist, Dr. Bruce Lipton, I don't know if anybody knows him, but mm. I, I've been doing a lot of... Um, listening to his lectures on YouTube, etc. And he really gets into the... He's an astrophysicist, quantum mechanic, molecular physicist, and he talks about it's all to do with the environment. Everything that was set up in your life from the beginning right through to the very end is learnt behaviours and, and environmental factors. It's not to do with addiction. And the reason why the drug industries and medical industries focus on disease and addiction mm -hmm. is because it's patented drug pharmaceuticals that make money for these very companies that then they can put onto the addict and say, you are wrong, you are this, you are that, you are genetic. And the other thing that Dr. Bruce Lipton really, really has uncovered, and he was called a quack back in the 50s and 60s, was that genetics is, it was one of the great golden kind of goose uh, uh, egg laying things from the pharmaceutical industries to use to say genetically, you are, you're, because your mother, uh, I know, did drugs and etc., you're going to be like that too. And it's actually bullshit. It, it does not, it does not uh, actually, it doesn't work. It's not 
true, genetics are not that uh, uh, simple, they are complex, and it isn't the one science fits all science, which is what the genetically modified industries in food and pharmaceuticals want us all to be on, and to believe in, and to worship, and to give our money towards. Uh, I, I mean, I, I'm really enjoying this, I'm so glad uh, I've done, I've come to this, this, this uh, thing which I was invited to, because I've been, I've been in the 12-step program now for the last 18 months, and, and, and I've loved it in the sense of the community, and I've enjoyed being uh, around uh, you know, people who you can see have saved lives. I think that's fantastic in NA. I think it's brilliant that it can do that, the behavioral change. And that's what I talk about, behavioral change. But when it comes to the fact that I have to say I'm Mia and I'm an addict, I have a problem with that. That's where I suddenly think, actually, this isn't my higher intuitive self talking. This is something I've been told that I have to say as the program and in the early days of me being part of NA I was asking is this program a matrix control program or is it a program that really helps people and it kind of got me into kind of a lot of really bad thinking because if I was to go back and have a glass of wine or smoke a joint or whatever it was mm. that got me there in the first place Am I going to beat myself up even more? Am I going to become yes. even more? Because I'm going to suddenly go, I'm a fucking addict, and that's it. And I'm a diseased human being, and I'm not a human being anymore. So I do have a difficulty with it, though I do know that it does work for a lot of people. So I'm there are, really There are grateful. smart recovery meetings in London that my... I can give you the details. I, I know about this intuitive. My ex-boyfriend, who's a crackhead, bless him, send him love, is in them. And that's why I came into the program, hoping he would follow me. But anyway, I'm glad I'm doing it, because it's an interesting place to be abstinence and, and I think that's <laughs> that's that's really yeah. interesting you well, know we, we've only got a couple more minutes sorry, so I want to take you. one more question if I can unless you want to oh, you're desperate to you, you, could you choose the person okay Mark? This, this, the woman at the front this lady's yeah. Been, yeah, yeah. hi can we get the microphone to the woman at the front thank so, you very sorry. much I, I so what I most appreciate about thank the you. discussion and where I what, what I think is most valuable is that we must question what we have typically thought of as true or what we have what has become a tradition, like the 12 steps and other methods uh, in recovery. Well, everything. Hang on, let the woman so, speak and then we can. Yeah. So I think that we David always we must do. look for the truth, and I think you've mentioned that several times. So, in addressing a couple of things, I wanted to look at brain plasticity. The entire brain is not plastic. So, I would like to address specifically what parts of brain anatomy or uh, functions can change over time and which can revert back to maybe a normal situation, including uh, neurotransmitters. And then also there are genetic components because we know from brain studies, especially those um, uh, coming from countries that track their patients from birth to death, uh, like in the Scandinavian sure countries. Sure there's genetic components. Okay. No one's denying so components. So which elements of the genetics are relevant to continued addiction. Because what I really want to do is, I don't like the disease concept, but I really do want to give people who are addicts or have been addicts good information okay. about what things may change over time and so what need, things may not. you need this book. Yeah, you probably do. Uh, it's all spelled, it's spelled out quite clearly. Well. With, with each of the five addicts whose stories I cover, I go through a different part of the brain, from the striatum to the... Uh, uh, well, the dorsal and ventral striatum uh, to the, the midbrain and the ventral tegmental area and the parts of the prefrontal cortex from orbital frontal on up to the dorsal lateral prefrontal. I mean, you know, this is a long conversation. But most of the forebrain is in fact plastic. The whole cortex is plastic, as we've talked about. So is the striatum, so is the amygdala, so is the hippocampus. Uh, and even the lower areas, the midbrain and so forth, and the uh, hippocampus, uh, the hypothalamus, are uh, plastic to a degree. So it's pretty surprising how much of this machinery can actually change. We can spell it out. That's not a problem. As far as the genetics, the dopamine system is particularly important here because the, some dopamine systems are more sensitive there are more receptors available to pick up the molecules. For some people, genetically, they're less sensitive. 
Yes, that's important. So let's focus on that. But the serotonin system is important too. Are you more prone to depression because you can't stir up the serotonin pod as much? Or are you less prone? So, you know, it's a really complicated picture. Yes, we need to spell it out. We need to figure it out. And then we need to integrate that stuff with all the stuff that's going on outside of the skin, outside of the skull, that involves other people, that involves context and environment and society. Uh, once I was talking to Mark on Skype and I was looking after my little niece and she was eavesdropping. And at the end of it, she said, my brain's not plastic, he's an idiot. <laughs> uh, with that thought, I, I really urge you, buy Mark's, if you're only get, you can buy both our books back there, please buy both, but if you can't, if you're gonna buy one, buy Mark's, this is an absolutely brilliant book. It's incredibly readable, it's incredibly, it's not difficult to read or to understand. It will really help you. Um, thank you so much to Mark Lewis and to all of you for coming. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Excellent, we'll go to the back now, yeah? Thank you. Thank you. Hey, hang on, let me come down and I'll... We've met, haven't we? I'll come down, hang on a sec. Let's go down and sign. Hi. Oh, uh, yeah, Mark, hi. sorry, I've been told right. strictly to not let him talk to people here, but...